lessons we learned from the 2017 and 2018 snow industry. Now this information and data we're using here from these five lessons is uh, brought to you by Hindsight Software. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, shape or form. Um, we are MNLA members and we got this in the mail. It's uh, you know the Scoop magazine they send out to you and it had this article in it which had some really, really good information in it and I wanted to share that with you guys so here we are talking about it. So let's get right into the video. All right, so out of the five things they covered, number one was basically you need to invest some money in a website. And this is, I mean, this is so obvious in today's day and age. Like if you don't have a website, what the heck are you doing? It's 2019. I know I'm a young kid saying that. I know there's a bunch of old guys out there that are like, I've operated without a website for so many years, don't need a website. And for some people, yes, that may be work. Um, and that has worked for so many years because there is a lot of older guys and gals out there that just run with that. Um, we're getting to the point where there's a lot of younger millennials stepping into positions of power, whether that be with commercial and uh, project management, things like that in the commercial side of things, or even the residential side of things. There's a bunch of millennials, younger guys that are buying uh, houses and things like that. So having a website, being involved with that technology, whether you're older or younger, is a huge part of the future because you know, us younger guys, we are the future and that's what we've grown up around is with the internet our whole lives and that's what the future is really going to be and that's where our attention goes to and that's where a lot of the future's attention is going to go to. So, you need to have a website. That is so important. Um, I mean, really that's just obvious. Basically, what we do with our website is we put pictures of the work we do on there. So we've got a whole portfolio of everything we do, whether it's simple stuff, lawn care, even snow plowing, just simple, easy things. We put pictures on there because when you put pictures of the work you do, people, you know, they might recognize the site you're working at. Oh, you do, I shop at Cub. You plow the Cub parking lot or oh, Walmart, whatever. I shop there. That's the work you do. They can put connections and see that, oh, you are around doing things. You do exist. And it's a sense of trust. And that's really what the whole thing of the website is, is you're building a sense of trust with your customer. Um, that's firmly what I believe is the biggest part of it is building a sense of trust. The customer can feel like they know you. You guys that have been in the industry for a long time or you know any industry at all, any business, you know word of mouth, word of mouth referrals are the best way to get work. That's just how it is and it's because the people that are referring you trust another person and they trust you as a business and it's a circle of trust. Everyone trusts everyone and that's why they recommend you and you end up getting the job. If you can build trust through a website with a customer or a potential customer, that's just another great way to generate a lead or you know, build a customer and a customer uh, database of people. So basically we use it to build a portfolio of pictures and hopefully turn that into a trusting relationship with a future customer that we can meet and work with. All right, so you can see here with the picture, um, basically this kind of breaks down uh, the following tactics that they use to generate business. Obviously you can see the largest proportion of it is word of mouth, but if you don't have any built up business or anything like that, there's obviously no way to really get word of mouth besides family and friends. Word of mouth is hard to start if this is your first year, kind of like it is for me. Um, so website is the next best go-to thing. And you can see it with the larger businesses with 100 plus, um, compared to the smaller businesses, they kind of spread it out and it's more of an even spread throughout everything. So you can see in the really large businesses where they have a lot of clients, they have a lot of employees, they have a lot of people they're working with, is they don't just put all their money into one thing. They diversify how they're getting business over multiple different areas and that's how they get so much business. You can see in the businesses where that are much smaller, one to five area, um, you can see those people, they've got a much more uh, narrowed down area where they get business from, mostly coming from the word of mouth and referrals, which is why they're still in that smaller section because they haven't uh, branched out into that cold calling, email, social media, uh, direct mail and things like that. They haven't broken out into that yet so that's why they're still in that small area. That's what I take away from this graph and I think that's what you guys should take away from it too is diversify yourself into everything but overall a website is a great place to direct people. Even when you're out talking with people, I give them a car and say, hey, here, my website's on there. Check out the website, see some pictures of the work we do so then you can kind of understand what we're all about here. And I've obviously got text and stuff like that on there kind of telling them and describing them my experiences and things about me and so I can build a personal connection with them. Like we are right now with YouTube, I'm building a personal connection with you guys. 
So personal connections and trust are extremely important with any business, with any business. So the second thing they talk about is uh, contract diversity. And this is basically how you're billing and you know collecting money from your customers. Are you doing per time, per hour? Are you doing um, you know a seasonal monthly contract? What are you doing? How are you billing? Basically, we'll put the graph up the graph up on the screen here and break this down. Um, it's a mix. It's a mix really between everyone. A lot of people here in the zero to five percent you can see say other. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but here's the way I look at it. I go out at the beginning of the year, you know, um, summer when I'm starting to get snowplow accounts and generating stuff like that, and I look at it, what are my costs gonna be this year? What do I wanna do in revenue for snow plowing? I kind of break it separately from landscaping, uh, excavation, whatever, et cetera, and I break down my snow plowing stuff. What are my costs gonna be for operating this business this year? What do I have to make to break even or to the point where it's like, why am I out here doing this? You know, what do I have to make to make it worth it? And that's where I kind of try to chase after, which it usually works better in this case with commercial contracts, is a per season contract. That means if it snows or not, I'm getting income every single month um, from these sites. I try to get a handful of those to the point where I can kind of cover my costs. That way, if it doesn't snow like this year almost at all, my costs are still covered. I'm still making money and covering my costs to the point where I can live, I can afford insurance. Um, you know, the payment on the truck, whatever, if you guys have a payment on a truck, something like that, you're not going bankrupt because you didn't make any money this winter. So that's how I look at it. First of all, I try to cover my costs the best I can. After that, I want to start moving everything into a per time because if you have a super, super heavy year and everything is based on a seasonal contract, every time you go out, you're losing money. That money's guaranteed if you have it on a guaranteed contract. So every time you go out, you're losing money. That way I'd like to break it down so I'm going out on a per time or a per inch scale, which breaking down how you price can become a totally different video too if you guys wanna see that. And if you do wanna see that, comment down below. But breaking it down is paying off my costs on a guaranteed income. Get everything guaranteed or per season. Then go to a per event, time and material, however you wanna charge it there, but every time you go out, you're still making money. That way, you got your cost covered for the year, and then when you go out to plow, you're not just losing money, you're adding additional revenue. Right now, how I'm structured, I've got pretty much all my costs covered for snow plowing, and then plus a chunk that I'm making on guaranteed income. And every time it, go, every time it snows and I go out and plow, I'm making a few hundred, few thousand dollars every single time we go out. So that's how I break it down, and I think that's the best way to do it. If you guys have something else that you use that works better, let me know in the comments below. So the other thing we like to add in there is salting costs. Um, if we can, I like to do all of that per ton because like this year we've had a lot of rain. We're gonna use a lot more salt uh, or freezing rain. It's just one of those things that's such an unpredictable thing. It's hard to put in into an overall cost or a per season cost for salt. However, if you have to do it to get the contract, you gotta do it. Um, it's just one of those things. If you can though, I recommend doing it per ton or billing per ton if you can. Just how I like to do it. So number three, uh, one of the biggest things I found was pay your subs quickly. Or more so, finding subcontractors in general is really hard for people. Or finding good subcontractors anyways. Um, basically, breakdown of the graph here, we've got finding good subcontractors is 54% of the problem with subcontractors for people. Um, just finding good guys to do it, reliable, on time, good quality, you know, equipment's good, they're out there, they're professional. Finding people like that are hard to find. And they found that paying them on time was the best way to keep people around. The quality of work you can see at 19% was the next biggest part, and then getting subcontractor work information so I can bill for it, is that, is that like 1099s, W9s, is that what it means? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, yeah, but basically finding good subcontractors. So what they found was paying them on time is huge and then basically just treating your subcontractors right is great. But this puts anyone that is a subcontractor, like myself currently for some jobs, you are at a huge advantage here. There's not a lot of good subcontractors out there. You can see, and this is the same for the labor force. If you guys are just in the industry, you don't own a business, you guys have a huge advantage here because labor right now is extremely hard to find and especially if you're an owner operator of a snow plow you you know one man band you and your snow plow truck or your skid loader and you're working for another company that has a bunch of accounts 
situation earlier in the year I came into. Um, gentleman had a, you know X amount to do a parking lot, this, this, and this, and it was totally on the other side of the cities from him. He got the account because he does a lot of Metro Transit work. Um, if you're watching, you know who you are. And basically, great guy. I like meeting with him. Really nice guy, fun guy. But moral of the story is it was way out of his way to do the work. He didn't want to do it. So I could have done it, and I could have done it for X amount, or he could have done it himself and it would have been a total pain in the butt, almost would have been impossible to do, quality of work wouldn't have been there. So he had to find a subcontractor to do it because it just was way out of the reach for him to do. That gives that subcontractor a lot of leverage in what they want to be paid to do it because they're kind of calling the shots more or less because finding good ones, reliable guys that are going to be good for your business and give you a good name and the customer is not going to want to fire you for them that's hard to find. So if you're a subcontractor, you're in a good position where you can, if you are a good subcontractor, I should say, not just any subcontractor, you have to be good, you have to be quality, on time, good equipment. But if you're a good subcontractor, that kind of gives you some leverage and I don't know if there's a lot of people that know that. Right now I'm just gonna say it, I'm getting paid 85 to 95 dollars an hour for my truck setup, you guys know what it is. If you're getting paid less than that in this area, um, you're getting paid too little and it is hard to find subcontractors. So use that as leverage, make yourselves some more money. So number four, they say to join a trade association. Um, MNLA is one of them. Um, just, you know, any type of association or membership thing with uh, the community you're in. And I think a lot of this is on here they said, and I quote, in the past year, I attended the following number of trade shows, educational conferences to improve my business knowledge. And here's the graph here, you guys can see it. Um, basically what they said is, in the Snow Industry Benchmark Report, also found that those who attended educational events, about half of the respondents were slightly more likely to experience profits in excess of 25% than their peers who didn't attend the events. Now, slightly more likely pretty vague terms but the point is you are much better off or you're much better odds of making profits in excess of 25 percent of your competitors just because you traded or attended a trade show now you can see here in the graph over 50 percent of people in this industry didn't even attend a trade show at all which i think is pretty strange because if you're in an industry and you enjoy doing it, why don't you want to learn about that industry? Why don't you want to learn about what's going to be best for your company and the best for you guys to do so you can make more money and your family can be better off, you can be better off and just make more money. Like, Why would you not want to better yourself? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Especially with snow plowing where it's an all or nothing. You have huge amounts of downtime to go out to these trade shows You know, if the days line up right and it's not snowing or something like that. So go out there, go to trade shows. I mean, there's great reasons to, uh, there's really no great reasons to not to. So here's a couple of the reasons I think, uh, they don't really talk a whole lot about why they do or why they make more money or that 25% profit compared to a competitors if they go to a trade show. I would assume part of it is you're learning about new technologies and things in the industry, but I think a huge part of it is the networking. You're going there, literally everybody there for the most part, does snow plowing or is involved in snow plowing, you know, if it's a snow plowing trade show or whatever. Everyone there is involved in it or needs the work done. You cannot walk into that room and they're in your area for the most part because a lot of these events are local. But you cannot walk into the room, shake the first person you see's hand and they can benefit you in some way potentially. I mean, this is great for subcontractors. There's a lot of these guys that do a lot, you know, millions of dollars in snow plowing every year that go to these shows to learn and to meet people like you subcontractors. A lot of you young guys like me that are starting out there that need some work and you want to be a subcontractor for somebody. Go to these shows, like introduce yourself to people, meet new people, and that's the best way to do business. It's just meeting new people and networking like that. And going to these trade shows, that's how you're going to experience the profits and that's how you're going to experience the profits quickly because you're going there, you're meeting new people that are like, hey, you know, I need this done. Could you, you're in that area, I'm not in that area. Could you do this? That's like, I went to, uh, my brother and I, Colton, we went to a state bidding event out on the west side of the cities and that's how we met this guy there. We were talking with him. He needed some work done here on the east side of the cities and he didn't want to do it. So we ended up working with him on that a little bit and um, it paid off. And it's just because I went there, met with them, shook his hand, said, hey, you know, my name's Carson, blah, blah, blah. This is what we do. 
here's where we're from. We were at that job as competitors to bid on the same job, to compete with each other, and it ended up working out best. That is another huge one, is just get out there, meet people, call people, whatever you gotta do, get to know the other people in the industry because they can help give you knowledge. Like I'm doing here with you, I'm giving you knowledge. Just do it with someone in your area that you can talk to. That's what these events are gonna do for you. So the fifth one here is, and it's really no surprise, is what is the biggest benefit of your software or you know, investing in software? Now this does come from a company that targets snow plowing companies to you know, sell them a software for snow plowing, uh, whether that be you know, time management, tracking your employees, GPS, clock in, clock out, things like that. I've looked a little bit into them, it seems like that's what they do. Um, a lot of you guys are familiar with Yardbook, it's kind of a similar program to that. And these guys help analyze your business and they're kind of consultants to help uh, grow your business like they're doing in this um, you know, research test here. So more or less I can see why they threw this in there. It's a, you know, it's a sales pitch for themselves basically. But I do agree with this. Now to an extent, I'm a one man band as of right now and my you know, dad, he's, uh, we've got you know, two, three guys doing snow plowing with him and we don't really need any type of software. It's pretty tight knit, it's easy, it's simple. But I can definitely see where if you've got more than five to 10 employees snow plowing, you might wanna invest your money in a software, especially if your guys, if you have uh, equipment sitting on site and the guys are just going out to the site and starting and you know starting on the site, they're never actually coming to your shop to pick up equipment or doing anything like that. What's so important about the software is they can go to the site, clock in on their smartphone, and it tracks their GPS, you know, they clocked in at this location. They're not clocking in at home and you don't know about it because the GPS would tell you so. They're clocking in at the site. So you're not getting cheated out of uh, man hours or things like that. So it's very valuable that way and you're always tracking for billing. Um, you know, I don't know, I've got right here, you know, GPS tags. My guy was on site from this time to this time. You can put that into your invoices and send that to the customer and quite frankly, I think customers really appreciate that. I think customers really appreciate when you have more information than less information, you know, to an extent, on your invoices because people are spending their hard earned money on your services. They want to know what it's going towards and what they're getting from it. That's very important. So having this software can definitely help grow your business. I think it's one of those things that, you know, the little guys, it's probably not so important, but if you want to go from the little guy to the big guy and kind of go to that next step, the software is going to help you do that. It's going to make it so much easier. And quite frankly, the way I see it, if you want to get to doing a couple million dollars a year in snow plowing, you either have to have software nowadays or you have to hire somebody else to kind of take care of the books and uh, clocking in and out, things like that for people and just managing all this, which you know, you're obviously going to have to have people to do that to an extent. But I think the software really can, if you're doing that volume of snow plowing, I think the software really can eliminate a person and uh, save you a lot of money there. The other aspect you can think about is GPS equipment tracking. If you leave stuff on sites, if you leave equipment on sites, you know, it's obviously locked, but it's a skid loader, I think, is one of the most commonly stolen things. Um, it's easy to steal. All the keys are almost the same for the most part. Some of them you program in a code, and it's, they're easier to steal than a car. Some people can just come load them up onto a trailer without even starting them. So there's so many skid loaders that are stolen. GPS equipment tracking can be huge, especially if you have a huge fleet of equipment. You know, if you've got 10, 20 skid loaders, you know, wheel loaders, trucks out and about, knowing where every piece of equipment at is at every single time or every single hour of the day is extremely important. And it can eliminate a theft or you can catch the person that stole it and then justice will be served. So. That's gonna be pretty much it for this video, guys. That's covered everything we got here today. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit that like button and hit that subscribe button if you guys wanna see more videos like this one. Until next time, guys, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.